Okay, old age, which every baby boomer is terrified of and lives in a world of denial about, and character, the idea of character. And the point of the book is that we age for the sake of character. And character is essential to being an ancestor, a guardian, a mentor, a, an old person. And as we grow old, we are not just aging, we are growing oldness in us. And oldness has a huge value. Now, I can't go into all of that, but but o oldness is a, a quality that we feel about trees and old paintings, old music, old mm -hmm. walls, old shoes, old hats. It makes you, there's something you love about something that's old. You also hate certain things that are old, but deep emotion arrives with oldness. And we have only understood oldness in terms of aging as a process rather than as a state of being. So that's a major part of the book. But in between, the book's divided into three parts. The first part is called lasting, and that tremendous strain that everybody wants to have longevity and last as long as possible. Um, one of the hotels I was just in on this tour had changed the name of their fitness center to their longevity center. <laughs> fact. Well. There's a fact. An essential fact. <laughs> a a, a, a symptomatic fact. Yeah, they should call it the Immortality Center anyway. <laughs> Either, no, I think, I think that the Immortality Centers are still in the, in the churches. The book is called uh, The Force of Character and the Lasting Life. So the first part's about lasting and various attempts at lasting, whether physiological exercise, but also extending your life, extending the idea of life, Ex life extension as extending it downward to descendants as in the biblical sense of seven generations, extending it into the world, and so on. There are many ways of extending life. The second part, from which I want to read a little piece, is called leaving. So we have lasting and then leaving. Your functions begin to leave you, your memory, your dry, dryness, your, you begin to sag. Uh, instead of going up, you're going down. Uh, a whole series of things, functions leave. Either they're leaving you or you're leaving the world or something is leaving anyway. And that's the part that people are upset about. And the last part of the book is called left. Lasting, leaving, left. What happens, what is left when you have left? What is left? What is still left when you have left? That image, that trace, that character, that influence, that ghost, that ancestor that you have left and what that's about. So what I want to do is read one of these pieces that generally we consider symptoms and occur in the middle part of the book. And this one I'm going to read is called Waking at Night. Why do old people sleep less at night and slip into little naps in broad daylight, dozing off in the midst of company? Why this reversal of conventional sleeping habits? Unlike the young who can zone out and lie comatose right up until lunch, we lie awake in the dark and doze off in daylight. With the years, normal sleep gradually dwindles. Night more and more becomes our time. Against our will, the ancient goddess Nyx, night, is forcing us to become her devotees. So much goes on at night, not only dreams and reminiscences and prayers, not only fears, those visiting demons who sit at the edge of your bed and recount your blunders and worries, and then fly off as vampires do once morning finally comes, even more insistent are pressing toilet calls. <laughs> In early years, the involuntary urge to urinate does not disturb sleep. Small children can wet their beds without waking, 
So strong is the child's need to stay asleep and to protect this sleep from waking in the night with its often fearful intruders. In late years, however, the urge to urinate interferes with sleep as if the wisdom of the older body calls you to wake up. Suppose once in monasteries and nunneries, night watch was called vigil and sleep was shortened on purpose so that when the Lord of Temptations came calling and his minions tried to enter your thoughts at night, you could ward them off. The early Christian monks who lived in desert caves tried to banish sleep altogether since pagan powers were thought to approach pious souls through dreams. <laughs> Moreover, since the visionary book of Revelation says, there shall be no night there, in the kingdom to come, some religions or religious orders have sought to approach their eternal day by literally banning sleep. So the devout person intent upon building a strong character was less eager to sleep than to keep watch at night. Awakening to the night opens a dark eye into the invisible world. It opens an acute ear to cautions, insights, and promptings that seem to visit only at night, disturbing sleep in order to be heard. We hardly suffer from the same crowd of anxieties and reconstructed nostalgic longings in daylight. This crowd of spirits that we call worry, self-castigation, anxiety, remorse, death terror, and erotic longing had similar names in the old world of the Mediterranean. For us, they are psychological abstractions, concepts like worry or remorse. For the ancients, they were personified figures, children of Nyx, of night, this female creature. And we can see these invisible persons, night's offspring, painted on vases and carved in relief, such figures as fatalistic foreboding. It, had a, it was an actual figure called Moros. Another one was called Momos, fault-finding. Another one was called Keres, or the, the Punishers. They were children of night. Fantastic. Avengers, Nemesis, angry persecutors, Irines, Miserable distress and cupris, lustful longings. These are all considered to be the children of night who come in to your place. The Bible calls Nyx by another name, Lilith, the night monster, quote, roaming with her retinue in the darkest hours of the night. To dream on without waking seems not to be what aging physiology wants. Not only do the bladder, the sphincter, and the enlarged prostate play their roles in getting men out of bed at night, but so does a strange, newly studied change in circadian or circadian rhythm. Research on men in Denmark and Japan shows that something happens to the younger habitual patterns of urine production. Quote, healthy young adults produce urine three times faster during the day than at night. Mm. Although the older men in these studies produce the same total amounts of urine as younger men in any 24-hour period, older men were no longer retaining salt and water during the night. They were instead excreting more sodium at night and thus voiding more frequently. The report concludes by saying that some people with nocturia, meaning pissing at night, have disordered, have disordered circadian rhythms. And then, and there's not much you can do to regulate your body's clock. So this is what I mean about the wisdom coming out of the body, not out of the Dalai Lama's books. The wisdom comes out of the body. You're awakened at night and you're being taught something about waking at night. Your body has already made some radical change. We are reckless sodium givers. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hold our salt. No. <laughs> you take some. <laughs> 
No, no. no. <laughs> On the dark <laughs> there is something, however, you can do about understanding your body's clock. You can't regulate it, but you could perhaps understand it. Men are being forced to learn another rhythm. Women were not included in these studies initiated as inquiries into prostate disorders and repairs. The biological clock intends to let's say, to rouse us elders from sleep and awaken us to the darkness around us. Plato called, this, called for this awakening from darkness in his famous allegory of the cave. The final two stanzas of William Stafford's fine, one of his finest poems about the erosion of character due to careless inattention, inattention puts it like this. And so I appeal to a voice to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. So why are older men awakened into the darkness? See what happens when you turn what's going on into a metaphor. When you begin to see the body is not physiology only, it's also something else. Evidently, we sleep less in later years because our tasks change. If once we were to be sheltered by night herself, now we must learn from her offspring, phantoms of fate, death, despair, blame, revenge, and desire won't let you rest. You have to discriminate among the invisible figures who share your home, even your bed. Letting them awaken you, receiving their biting attacks, and studying the legitimacy of their claims, this is hard work. An hour or two with the children of night, wide-eyed wide in a dark room, can be exhausting. Little wonder, in fact, we toss and turn. It takes the whole body into it. Little wonder that some 80 different sleep disorders have been catalogued, and that there are 337 sleep disorder clinics in the United States. 10% of the population report a nightmare at least once a month. Little wonder then that so many of us take sleeping pills and wear incontinence pads so that we can rise in the morning without having had to tangle with and learn from the persecutory brood of Nicks. Why is 4 a.m. such a big 3 a.m. It hits you at 4? Yeah. I'm an hour late, you know. You're in yeah, that's right. You're, you're in the central zone, I'm right. I got that. <laughs> well, I think they're demons. They are. And they're gone in the morning, just like the vampires. You know, when the daylight comes, the vampires are gone. Those demons, you wonder, what the hell kept you awake for those two hours? But they're also demons that bring you new ideas. Yeah. They bring you poems once in a while about it. <laughs> oh. I, I do believe she wants us to know her better. Perhaps she takes offense at our methods of avoiding knowledge of the night. Our culture's light pollution and its after-dark noise levels may be offensive to her. Who knows? What place outdoors and nearby is free of artificial light and the sounds of civilization? Now, I'm not talking about Moose Lake, of course. I mean, Jesus. I don't suppose there's a... <laughs> How far do we have to travel to look up to a full sky of stars? What do you or I know about differentiating night beyond divisions into prime time, late night, and bedtime? Do we know night's sounds and smells? 
where the constellations are, the moon's condition, the soughing of the wind at dawn, how the house rattles and settles. Besides the animal creatures that thrive on the night's black air, besides thieves, third shift workers, jazz players, street walkers, and other night crawlers, all invisible in the daytime, besides these, inanimate things come alive in the dark, as so many fairy tales and ghost stories tell children. The restless mind is besieged by insights. Lying sleepless, we develop a strange intelligence. Is this how the images of the dead communicate? How the ancestors instruct us? Many indigenous peoples wait until nightfall to sacrifice to ancestor spirits and to feast and dance to propitiate their fear, fearful powers. Keeping vigil to know the night was one way of gaining strength from the invisible world. Specific rituals belong to different phases of the night, as if the night had a variety of faces. In medieval Japan, there were clocks that told time by releasing smells. Every two hours, a different odor wafted through the air, so that on waking in the dark, you could literally sense what time it was. You know, our clocks before clocks were all sundials. There was no time in the night. It's all part of our cultural craziness about daylight, our solar culture. For us, night is mostly all the same. In our blinds drawn room, we little know or care whether what we awaken to is the darkness of midnight, 3 a.m., or just before daybreak. No patrolling watchman calls the hours, no bells peal from the towers and steeples. Yet the body has its timekeeper, and nurses on night duty know to expect certain crises in different patients at particular hours. We do not distinguish the parts of the night because we have yoked Nicks to day world duties. We go to bed for oblivion, not for worry. Nighttime is for catching up on sleep, for being recharged for tomorrow, which will take off manic. We'll needle our scalps with a quick hot shower, followed by a jolt of juice, some cheery pops and snaps, a mug of sugared caffeine, rituals to ban the last traces of Nix and her brood, and the sleeping drugs we have taken to keep her at bay. <clears throat> I think that's enough of that piece. There's some more, but I think that's... But there is a wisdom in the waking at night, maybe just that. You learn that your emotions are not quite yours, that they are not so much to be controlled as to be reckoned with. See, they're visitations, these emotions. Worry is a vi figure that comes in and sits there for two hours. Remorse is another one. Lust is another one. You learn that your emotions are not quite yours. They're not so much to be controlled as to be reckoned with. Fatalistic anxieties, recriminations, and vengeful afterthoughts that come in the night come from the night. They derive neither from your brain and its processes nor from your personality and its behaviors. They belong instead to the dark, impersonal underside of the world which becomes personally available to you through the ordeal of nighttime awakenings. Where are they coming from? From night. From Ms. Night. You expect me to believe that? Yes. <laughs> no, don't believe it, entertain it. Uh, okay, I'll entertain <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, watch out what you believe, but entertain all kinds of things. Um, any, any comments on the night, on this? Yes. Well, I think I, I'm talking about actually piss, you know, waking up at night. In other words, I'm taking these, these symptoms that come to you in later years and trying to show they have some sense in them. 
So I'm really talking about the, the actual uh, waking at night. But it elaborates into awakening to darkness, and that leads to what you're just saying. The dark side of the world. After all, 50% of the world is in darkness all the time. 50% of our lives is in nighttime. But you're saying that these night beings have been living around for a long time. Yeah. And they could be connected with ancestors or not, but they're very old. And they find you. Yeah. You're bad. Yeah. They come out of what you call the other rooms of the house, maybe. And they find you in your bed. I mean, you, I've been found. Have you been found? Yeah. That vengeful stuff really is true. Yeah. And it feels mad in the morning. Yeah. You already settled that whole thing, he said to you. <laughs> but in the middle of the night, I want his address. You know, in the Indian music system, every, I don't know if it's every four hours or every two hours. That's interesting. Well, when you play through the night, you use a different yeah, uh, that's great. a different scale. Yeah, that's and, great. They, and each one of those scales, the robins, has a different mood to it, a different <coughs> feeling to it. So that's something, you know, that's a very old that's culture a, yeah. of music and something that they understood, that the music you play at 4 a.m. is not the same that you play at midnight or at dawn. <coughs> Yeah, it's great. It's you great. see, we don't have that. We have to, we we take sleeping pills to it to ignore that information. It's that's great. Yeah. I, I just have a I guess a, a question about what maybe that information is all about because it seems like in in my experience of you know limited experience of insomnia and the people that I've talked to, especially older people that have kind of experienced that up in the night kind of thing. A lot of it seems so um, so petty, or a little repetitive thoughts about you know the grocery list, or gee, I you know I should have bought milk and there won't be enough, and they lay there for three hours, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. You know, compared to sleep and sort of phantasmagoria of, of the dream life, it, it seems so minuscule and, and almost ridiculous. And I'm just wondering what that might be about. Well, I don't know what that might be about. I, I would think that it sounds as if trivia is one of the daughters of night. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, the, the, some of the regurgitated input of the day comes up at night. Uh, but I still think that uh, the night terrors and the night longings are below that. And the grocery list can be just a a shield. It's sort of the lawyer of your night terrors talking to your lawyer. Plea <laughs> 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 bargaining. <laughs> yeah, plea bargaining going on at night. Yeah. Go ahead. This is almost more a question for Robert, but are some of these children of the night the knots that you're referring to too? It's a, the, I don't know. The nafs is the word that the, yeah, the spirit Islam used for the greedy person. Oh, the greedy person, the wild lord of ill temper. Um, so I suppose that uh, he has more of a chance late at night. But he can he can come at any time of day or night. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I have a little chapter in here called heightened irritability. Yeah, and that's him. That sounds like him. That's huh? him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about the obsession with the soul or with the day? And to listen to Lady Nix at night as a cause of prostatic hypertrophy or prostate cancer. Now say that one again. The one more time. <laughs> the refusal to listen to Lady Nix oh. and her gatherers at night as a cause of prostate hypertrophy which is about 80% of all autopsy males have, and prostate cancer is... But let me ask you, does the prostate increase its size during the night? Does well, I'm, I'm wondering about it from well, your point of view and a sort of an auric energetic point of view, that if you persist in a persistent um, 
conscious stance long enough that your energy field becomes altered long enough that it actually manifests itself with a physical mm -hmm. observable disorder and the prostate does actually enlarge no one's actually dissecting well i like that I, that's a lovely way to begin thinking about that prostate because all they do about it is talk about you know which half of it is swelling and and uh, it's a walnut sized gland you know you get these um, it's also Muladhara, which is the base of the Kundalini. So the perineum, the anus, the testicles, but basically it's the, the where the prostate is located. Is the is, and Muladhara means not only the root of sexual energy. Here he comes. white fox is also the word means the root base the community it's the earth place of where one is basically as if to say one's village one's family one's earth one's place it doesn't just mean my personal uh, energy and that raises interesting thoughts about male isolation not being rooted in place and the possibilities of prostate distortion. I mean, if there is relations between bodily systems and cosmology, that our body is not only physiology, it's also cosmology. Is it possible, uh, Professor, that or Dr. James <laughs> Hall prefer to be addressed? <laughs> <laughs> It's as, it's as simple as the as the old men are the, the universe our bodies are calling old men I'm not an old man to put on the fire just wait and to put on and to put on the bread for the young men and for their families at 4 a.m. so that as we have experienced this weekend someone comes at four in the morning and cooks a meal so that when we're ready to do the day we're ready and is it possible that biology is just <laughs> Telling the old men or giving to the get old up. men that role. Get up and pray, do whatever. Get up and get up and, <laughs> get, and up, get up and pee is what he said. No. <laughs> well maybe they have to be forced. Get up. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, I mean I, I mean there are cultures all over the world where where people got up at sunrise and it was just part of their experience. But in our culture perhaps it is that we that this prostate we need the prostate to give that pain, to send that message so that it happens. We get the pain because we're not looking at some things in our lives. It's like people become 50, 60, 70 years old in this culture and they get the house and the car and the golden parachute and the whole package and the prostate cancer because they're not looking at things, whatever that may be, which is what we're discussing. But. Many cultures wake up between 3 and 5 a.m. all over the world. Mm -hmm. Chinese look at it as lung time. It's a time the lungs are most active mm -hmm. on the meridian clock. It's time to breathe. It's time to have inspiration, spirit come into the body. It's time to pray. Mm -hmm. So that may be one reason to get up. You're also, you're, uh, your yin is particularly low. So you get what I had for a while called cox crow diarrhea. That's right. <laughs> Which, me, which right. means early morning diarrhea, astounding. And the only person who was able to understand that was one of these Chinese people. Because the, the yin hasn't come up yet, and so the, the yang is already moving, and there's no, so. The yin deficiency, you have yeah. too much yang, which means so too much they're, heat. They're, it's a, they're, the symptoms in the middle of the night, all these things at night, are deeply interesting and have a lot to do with, with the deepening of character. That's the point of th that, that whole section of the you book. wait until dawn? Is the one I don't know. Out? I'm not Chinese. I didn't understand what it was. You're not Chinese. Yes? talking about a partner. A partner. A partner. When I you mean the partner's diarrhea? No. no. Sleep, oh. I sleep better with my partner than I do without my partner. Here I wake up four or five times in the night with mm -hmm. my partner, maybe once. So your bladder notices no, that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't get up and pee or four times. I see. You don't want to leave yeah. a hot body. I just wake up for it. Mm -hmm. 
A lot, of, a lot of people farting all around you. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, went, I went through a year, of, well, maybe a year and a half, of soaking at least one t shirt every night. Yes. And I would put two or three t shirts night on, sweats. On, on the dresser. I'm sure a lot of you don't. And I mean, so you could bring it out. I'd wake up and I'd have to change pillowcases, just so. And, and what came of that? Anything? It, it stopped. You know, and now the most I get is just a little around the collar. That's not it. I don't. Uh, we wrestle a lot with the spirits at night. I think that's the that's the thing. There's a lot of it's heavy work. I notice that when I, I get up in the middle of the night to pee, I don't want to go to the bathroom because I'll wake my wife. So I go outside and uh, pee off the deck, which is something she doesn't like very much. <laughs> <laughs> You got it bad both ways. You can't wake her up and you can't pee off the deck. That's like, you know, <laughs> when a man says something alone in the woods and a woman is not there, is he still wrong? <laughs> No, no, he hasn't finished it. But what I notice about it is that's such a satisfying time in the middle of the night. I look up at the stars, I breathe the night air, and it's a very sweet and sacred moment, that going outside to pee. That in the busyness of my day and maybe just ending the day and going to bed, you know, from work to bed on a really hard day, it's that one time in the 24 hours that I might have a little, uh, a little place of soul and spirit. And well, that's very nice. I mean, that's a lot better than, you know, getting up and staggering in the dark to the toilet and missing the toilet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to start that. <laughs> I'm sure whoever cleans up the, uh, the, the bathroom floor will appreciate that. <laughs> Doug, yeah. I have some experience now of the, of the waking up in the middle of the night. And as long as I felt like I needed to resist and get back to sleep, uh, then it's uh, anxiety causing Jesus That's Christ, good. I'm not sleeping. Yes. Not, 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 not. But getting into it and just saying, OK, here we are. This what have I got cooking now. Uh, and thoughts of death, usually. And then I'm glad that I'm still alive to be thinking about death. <laughs> Seriously. Mm. And then comes uh, wonderful ideas mm. and strange mm. things to think about that I didn't have time to. Mm. And after time, I may go back to sleep again. And there's not, I, I kind of like it. Mm. Just to have that time to have these things come in. Okay, well, another, well, a couple more, and then I'll read something else. Yeah. The way that I've learned to look at that is. During the daytime, we had our workshops, in other words, called our day job that we go to and we do that stuff. And if we, as you say, entertain the idea that at night we have our workshop and we do the stuff like what Doug is talking about and allow ourselves to work on that stuff at night, and yeah. gives me the, mm -hmm. the possibility mm -hmm. of doing more than just letting the demon worry visit me. Then I allow all of the others to visit in a night workshop and do my night work. There you go. Good. And the thing is, yeah. the night work's not jobs, those are like tasks. The demons are probably just so different. Yeah. There, uh, there are some heavy demons that still come contrition and remorse and worry and things like that. I mean, I don't want to smooth it over. Uh, and they have a lot to do with deepening and, and, and bringing oldness into the soul. 